All right, can you hear me well? Uh, it's time to get started. Uh, welcome everybody from the break. This is a documentation session. Uh, my name is Dennis uh, Poshavanek, I'll be uh, session chair. So we have uh, several really interesting papers, a mix of research papers and journal first paper presentations. So the first paper um, will be um, on developer intent driven code common generation. And the presenter, I could ask you to come up the podium, will be Fang Wen Mu. And he will present the paper. Hi everyone, I'm Fang Wen Mu from Institute of Software, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Today my topic is developer intent driven code common generation. As we all know, there are two things that bother developers about code comments. The first thing is to read code without comments. Comments are, comments are essential. The first thing is to read code without comments. Comments are essential parts of software and provide descriptive information about the functionality, design rationale, and the usage of the code. In particular, with the software growing size and complexity, it is difficult to understand the code without any comments. The second thing is to write comments for code. Manually writing code comments is tedious and time consuming. And with the acceleration of the software integration, it has become a heavy burden for developers. As one participant in a survey said, everyone wants others to write as many comments as possible, but they don't want to write comments. So how to help developers? Automatic code comment generation can address this problem. This task aims to automatically generate a high quality comment for a given code snippet. Traditional methods generate code comments based on the fixed templates or information retrieval techniques. They are good at extracting keyword information from the source code, but are limited in generalization. In recent years, with the development of deep learning, there is an emerging interest in applying neural networks for automatic code comment generation. Uh, many neural-based approaches have been, appro have been proposed and have significantly improved the performance of common generation tasks. However, the existing common generation ma methods typically, typically model the input code and output comment as a one-to-one -one mapping. For example, when we input a Java method start into the Rankos model, the generated comment only describes the functionality of the method. However, in real-world practice, comments are complicated, and a code snippet is often associated with multiple comments reflecting different intents. As shown in this table, JET or manually checked comments from real-world projects and identified five categories of developer intent. For example, the word category gives a description of the method functionality. The Y category explains the reason why the method is provided, or the design rationale of the method. Uh, the how to use category describes the usage of this method. So yes, the existing code common generation method do not consider the developer's intent. Thus, it is appealing and important to develop an approach to generate comments which can satisfy virus intents. To bridge the gap, we define a new task called developer intent driving code common generation, which aims to produce comments that are coherent with the given intents, such as what, why, and how to use. To solve this task, we propose a novel approach named Doom. Uh, the architecture of Doom is shown in this figure. Doom takes a code snippet and an intent category as an input, and output the comment that describes the code based on the given intent. It consists of three com main components, exemplar retrieval, encoder layer, and the decoder layer. So for the first component, is the uh, exemplar retrieval, which is used to retrieve the most similar comment as the exemplar. Uh, we first connect a multiple intent couples D that consists of triples, code, comment, and intent. Giving a code snippet X and an intent category E, we extract triples with the same intent as the given intent category from the corpus D, and take them as the retrieval corpus DE. 
Then we employ the dense passenger retrieval model to retrieve the most similar code from the retrieval corpus and treat its comment as an exemplar. The second component is the decode-encode layer, which is used to encode the source code, the retrieved exemplar, and the target intent into semantic vectors. The encode layer consists of an intent embedding layer, a code encoder, and an exemplar encoder. Specifically, the intent embedding layer is utilized to capture the high-level abstraction of intent expressions. Um, we use, for each intent E, we use an embedding matrix to map it into the intent embedding vector. The code encoder and the example encoder aim to extract, extract the semantic features from the code, from the code snippet and the retrieved example. We construct the two encoders by following the st structure of the vanilla transformer encoder. Note that the code encoder has two outputs, a token-level code representation and a statement-level code representation. We obtain these two representations because they can provide different level information and will be, to calculate, will be used to calculate the intent-guided attention. The third component is a decode layer, which aims to generate the intent-aware comments. We also construct the decode layer based on the transformer decoder, but one difference is that we add the intent-guided selective attention to enable the decoder to capture the intent-relevant information and ignore the irrelevant noise. Our proposed attention contains three calculation steps. The uh, statement level attention calculation, a token level attention calculation, and the combining attentions. Specifically, we first take the intent embedding and the statement level code representation as input to calculate the statement level attention, which aims to select the most relevant statements for, uh, from the source code based on the given intent. Similarly, we calculate the token level attention to remove the destruction from those irrelevant tokens based on the token level code representation and the intent embedding. Uh, finally, we combine these two attentions to get the final attention scores. By using this attention mechanism, Doom can select the intent relevant information from the source code, thereby controlling the content and the style of the generated comments. So for the evaluation part, we select two widely used benchmarks, FONCOM and TLC, as the experimental data sets. As I mentioned earlier, existing comment generators do not take developer intent into account. So these public data sets also have no intent information. However, training and evaluating Doom require a large volume of labeled intent data. So we first randomly sample 20K Sorry. So we, okay. so we first uh, so we first randomly sample twenty k code common uh, code common pairs from the two benchmarks and invite five developers to manually annotate the data into the six intent categories. Uh, the statistics, the statistics of the annotated data as shown in table two. Then we utilize this data to train a classifier, which is treated as the auto annotator to classify the remaining code comment data into six intent categories. Since some comments are unspecified or ambiguous, we identify them into others category and include them from the final experimental data sets. Uh, in the evaluation, we focus on the three, res the three research questions. For the first research question, we explore how does the DOOM perform compared to the SOTA common, uh, common generation baselines. We evaluate the performance of different methods using three common metrics, blue, rouge, and meteor. The, the results show that for each intent category, DOOM outperforms the SOTA baselines in terms of three metrics. Compared to the best baselines, Doom improves the performance of Blue by 26% and 10% on FONCOM and TLC datasets, respectively. The second research question is how each component in Doom contributes to the overall performance. To answer this question, we compare Doom with two variants. 
The first is DOOM without ISA, which replaces the uh, intent-guided selective attention with uh, vanilla across attention to, to generate comments. The second, the second is DOOM with ER, which removes the exemplar retrieval and only use the encoder-decoder framework to generate comments. The results show that both the ISA and the ER components have positive contributes to the performance of DOOM. The last research question is hum human evaluation. We explore what is the preserved quality of the intent-aware comments generated by DOOM. We first collect the 10 most star Java projects on GitHub and use the auto annotator to label this data with in intents. We randomly sample 100 code snippets and generate their comments by using Doom, as well as the three best performing baselines. We invited six developers, and each developer is asked to rate each comment from the three aspects. The results show that uh, Doom achieves the highest scores on accuracy, adequacy, and naturalness, respectively. So let's summarize our work. First, we propose Doom. To our best knowledge, this is the first work that can generate diverse comments given different categories of intents. Second, we conduct an experimental evaluation of the performance of Doom, which shows that Doom outperforms all baselines in main evaluation metrics. Third, a human evaluation also confirms the significant potential of applying Doom in practical usage. That's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? If you want to ask a question, please come up to the microphone so that we can hear you. Okay, so since uh, ChatGPT overtook the world at the beginning of the year, there's been a lot of interest in using large language models for understanding, paraphrasing text. I wonder how it would do on comments. Is your methodology something that could be compared with or combined with a large language model assisted approach? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Uh, ChatGPT. Uh, 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 I think the contributions of our work is focused is uh, is mainly focused on design a new task called develop intent common generation, and uh, uh, there is a work following my uh, following our work to propose the multi intent common generation. Uh, in this work, they use uh, ChatGPT to uh, generate the diverse in, uh, comments. I'm sorry, the which comment? Uh, yeah. you, you said they use ChatGPT to generate some kind of comment, and I missed the adjective there. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, there is an existing work that uses the uh, uh, ChatGPT to generate the um, uh, multi, the multiple comments reflecting different intents. Okay. Uh, they use uh, mm -hmm. uh, they give the uh, they use the in context learning, which provides the examples that uh, uh, that are coherent with our work. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, there is one more question coming. So I was wondering about the manual uh, labeling work because it takes a lot of time. So how long did you, uh, uh, how many many hours did you spend to for labeling work? And also in the future, how will you improve that part? You mean the label the data set? Yes. So, so you uh, explain twenty. Twenty. Yes. Twenty. Uh -huh. Yes. We manually turn the 20k uh, code common pairs uh, by five developers, and each developer uh, needed to uh, uh, label the uh, 8k code common pairs. So there is a, a overlapping, and uh, each uh, we think the yes the uh, the, uh, the labeling process is time consuming, and we will we spend. Uh, uh, um, amounts uh, uh, one month to uh, label this data. 
right? Thank you. And you made the data available, right? Um, yes. Yeah. So that's great. If you want to use it, refer to the paper. All right. Let's uh, thank the speaker. Uh, all right. Our second research paper is going to be on data quality matters, a case study of obsolete com detection. And uh, Zheng Dongju will present the paper. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Sheng Bing Xu from Nanjing University. It's a great honor for me to stand here and uh, share our work. Uh, this, is, this is a joint work with TikTok, and the title is Data Quantity Matters, a case study of obsolete comment uh, detection. Uh, my presentation consists of four parts. First, uh, background and motivation. Uh, then we introduce handling false positives where data cleaning, and next uh, handling false negatives where generative adversarial network. Uh, finally, we make conclusions. Uh, as we know, in the past uh, years, machine learning has been widely used in many software engineering tasks like uh, program repair defect detection, code summarization, obsolete common detection, the main focus of these efforts is on uh, developing uh, customized machine learning models that can unleash the value of the uh, valuable data. Uh, we chose the obsolete comment detection task as our object, uh, and obsolete comment example from uh, a park is uh, shown on the screen. We can see that uh, the method uh, register the metrics of the producer, consumer, and admin clients, but only the consumer clients are recorded, so the comment is obsolete. The reason of the comment being obsolete is that a developer added these two underlined lines to the methods and overlooked the Java doc when they changed the code. Uh, Neo et al. proposed uh, obsolete comment detector to automatically detect uh, obsolete comments when developers make code changes. Specifically, they uh, construct a neural network that takes the code change and uh, comments as input and outputs the probabilities that, uh, of comments being obsolete. Uh, to train and test the uh, neural model, uh, new uh, collected more than four million samples Specifically, for each target repository, uh, they iterated through the commit and extract modified uh, methods and their corresponding Java doc to further decide which sentence in the Java doc is obsolete. Uh, they divided each doc into multiple sentences. Finally, the label of uh, each uh, sample is determined by simply comparing the old comment with the new comment. Although the data set has been carefully constructed, we observe some uh, duplicate samples. Also, the label uh, will determine according to simple heuristics, which may need to incorrectness, including first, uh, false positive and false negative. In the left part, uh, we show two false positive samples. The change from uh, old comment to new comment are grammar correction. Uh, making this sample as positive uh, would mislead the learning model to capture grammar corrections instead of actual uh, semantic changes. Uh, the sample in the right uh, are negative, but according to the code, uh, uh, title view and the key group index should be uh, changed to view and the key group range. Such false, po false negatives may make the learning model less, consist, cons, uh, less sensitive to the case when the comment should be updated, as well as prevent the model effectiveness from being accurately assessed. Our work aims to investigate the data quality issue in our solid comment detection task. To be specific, we mainly raise two research questions. First, 
uh, to what extent machine learning based observational common detection approaches affected by the data quality issue? Uh, second, uh, can we automate the detection of false negatives so as to mitigate the impact of uh, quality issues? To answer uh, RQ1, we first uh, do data cleaning and then apply existing machine learning based methods on both the original and uh, cleaned data set and uh, evaluate uh, all the model on the same test set. Specifically, we first uh, do uh, sample deduplication, which removes approximately 15% of the data. Then we do uh, label correction for false positive samples. This is based on the observation that format change accounts for most of the false positive samples. We adopt the try and error method uh, to define five rules to uh, detect false positives. Uh, based on the defined rules, 7,304 false positive samples are identified from the whole clean data set. Uh, we correct uh, their label instead of uh, removing them. Uh, the results are listed on the table. All models are tested on the same 1,000 uh, 1, manual labeled samples. Uh, the results show that uh, data, cleaning, data cleaning can improve the performance of existing solid common detection methods. Uh, for RQ2, we get inspiration from generative adversarial network and the proposed uh, uh, adversarial learning framework consists of uh, a classifier C and a discriminator D. C and D use the same structure. The framework requires two training sets. Uh, uh, the R and the U. R is uh, smaller but consists of uh, uh, more reliable samples. And the, uh, uh, the other is the uh, unreliable samples. So uh, in this framework, the purpose of D is to uh, distinguish between reliable and unreliable samples, while the uh, purpose of C is to make D unable to distinguish between reliable and unreliable samples. The detailed training algorithm is shown on the right. Uh, reliable samples are identified based on uh, a, a dump chain, uh, uh, which means that uh, when developer update a Java doc, uh, that means developer checked the doc, and the checked doc is more reliable. So based on the assumption, we identified more than 100,000 reliable samples from the cleaned training set. We consider the other sample in the cleaned training set as unreliable samples. Uh, to encode each sample, we also propose a hierarchical encoding methods. Uh, the results are shown uh, on the uh, table. Our approach is significantly outperformed the existing baselines. Uh, to conclude, in this paper, uh, we have proposed an absolute the common detection approach, which mainly focuses on uh, data quality aspect, and it consists of data cleaning module that uh, uh, correct some false positives and the data sample encoding modules that captures the complex semantics among code changes and the comments, and the uh, uh, detection model learning module to deal with false negatives. Uh, experiment evaluation shows that existing uh, common detection methods can be significantly improved by simply applying them on the cleaned training data. Uh, our approach can further outperform the existing methods based on the proposed data sample encoding and uh, adversarial learning methods. Uh, finally, uh, we summarize some implications of our work. First, the data cleaning workflow, uh, uh, such as uh, IE uh, discovery, then uh, error detection, and then error repair. We use and the ideas behind them are universal. Uh, 
second, the adversary and learning work framework can be used for various types of noisy data sets. Uh, as long as a relatively reliable subset can be identified, uh, it can be uh, uh, identified based on some assumption, or you can manually enable uh, uh, some uh, reliable samples. Uh, thank you. Uh, any question? Thank you very much. Questions? All right, a few questions uh, come up to the microphone, please. Uh, I have a quick classification question. So could you please uh, put, uh, go back to the slide uh, when you um, deal with uh, false negative and you do manual labeling, is that? Okay, this. Uh, you manually labeled over uh, over three so, uh, three hundred thousand or three millions labels to get whether they are reliable or unreliable. Uh, 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 uh. It, it, or this is a result of your of your uh, classifier or the GAN? Uh, yes, but. Uh, uh, we did not manually enable this uh, reliable sample. We uh, we classify them according to the assumption chain. Uh, uh, in the as the new uh, new ETL proposed their data set, they. Uh, uh, I am familiar with the process, so you can just go ahead. Okay. Uh, we, we, uh, to identify the reliable samples, we did not manually enable them, but we uh, uh, gave uh, the label according to uh, the dog is uh, checked, uh, uh, whether the dog is uh, checked by the developer. Checked by the developer is uh, uh, in, after code review, or you use some heuristics to. Uh, 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 the, we think uh, 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 we can see the data set contain uh, positive sample and negative sample. Okay. They are, uh, they are the label are, are obtained by compare them. Okay. So we think. Uh, the uh, positive sample are uh, updated by the developer, which means the uh, uh, positive sample uh, are checked. Or we yeah. can see the, uh, the bulk of the uh, positive sample are manually checked by the developer. So all the... All the positive samples are reliable. Yes, and the uh, sentence uh, in the in, same... Okay, in the same doc is reliable too, so uh, yes, other yes. things are unreliable. Yes, yes. But this could introduce noise in your unreliable... Uh, uh, yes, so we, uh, our uh, motivation is that they are relatively reliable than the unreliable data set. It's, it's uh, relatively, okay. we don't... Uh, 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 I understand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let me let me ask you a quick controversial question. Why do we even need to worry about obsolete comments? Because you know these generative approaches are becoming so good, and you basically just need just in time comments that can be generated on the spot. Why do we need to worry about obsolete detecting obsolete comments? Uh, uh, we think uh, in. in on one hand, uh, it's, it can uh, misleading or uh, 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 it can uh, provide uh, wrong information to developer. Uh, when when uh, developer uh, seek for document of, uh, to understand the code. So uh, uh, Obsonia comment is uh, a disaster. Uh, uh, next. Uh, the new generated comments uh, may be not uh, 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 focused on the same aspects as the original doc. 
so it's, it's uh, the original doc is written by a developer, it's, it's needed, but the uh, generated is, uh, uh, don't consider the developer intention. Right, but at the same time, we have plenty of studies that show that comments become obsolete very fast, or comments decay much faster than code. So, uh, an interesting uh, question to think offline is uh, how to balance the need of detecting absolute comments versus generating documentation on the spot, in my opinion. Oh, uh, uh, I think uh, if we uh, detect our sonia comments uh, fast, uh, uh, or we see when we commit the code, uh, there is a tool to automa automatically detect the obstruction comment. It's a great help to, uh, uh, to developers. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Let's thank the speaker. All right. Uh, our next paper is a research paper uh, on uh, revisiting learning-based commit message generation. And... Um, Jing Hao Gong will present the paper. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jing Hao, and I'm from Peking University. It's my great honor to introduce our work revisiting learning-based commit message generation. When the developer commits the code changes to a version control system, they also need to attach a commit message, which is very important to understand and maintain the code changes for other developers. They don't need to dig into the implementation details of the code changes, and they can learn about the rationales and intentions of the code changes according to the commit message. However, writing commit message manually is labor intensive. It's, it's very challenging for the developers to um, describe the in intentions and the rationales precisely, and the modern software involves very, very rapidly, so the commit messages are often neglected by the developers. As is reported, 14% commits lack the commit messages. To alleviate the efforts to write commit messages manually, the researchers have proposed uh, uh, various automatic techniques to generate the commit messages, including the template-based, information retrieval-based, and the learning-based. With the development of deep learning models, the researchers have adopted the neural machine translation models to generate the message automatically because of the strong ability to understand the code changes, the learning-based techniques achieve the state-of-the-art performance. Despite achieving the, prom achieving the promising performance, there exist problems in the measurement of the generated commit messages. The existing techniques mainly leverage the NLP metrics to measure the quality of the generated messages, as shown in this figure as shown in this table. The NLP metrics measure the um, text similarity between the generated messages and the ground truth ones. But uh, what do the scores really mean? And uh, are the commit messages where higher scores um, uh, have the better quality, definitely? And uh, which part of the commit message results in the higher scores? The NLP metrics can't answer these questions because they are only an aggregated scores. We can't learn about the, what the commit message look like, or we can't know the structures or details of the messages according to NLP metric. Here we give an um, example. In this example, the developer removes the um, unnecessary typecast in this class. In this commit message, the word remove is the most important because it can reflect the semantics of the code changes. In addition, we show a wrong commit message, which, is on, which only has one word which is different from the ground truth one. So the wrong commit message have, has a high NLP metric. But these two messages have the, uh, wrong, have the opposite semantics. So, um, although it can uh, achieve the high NLP metric, but uh, the, it has the wrong semantics. Therefore, the NLP metrics sometimes can't reflect the real performance. So, how can we evaluate the semantics of the commit messages? 
In this work, we propose to evaluate the uh, generated messages from uh, a new perspective, that is pattern. And here we show four commit messages. And when the developer writes them, there often exist some um, patterns, such as uh, add missing tool, or remove unused, or fix in. So in this work, we man and summarize the uh, frequent patterns which in the commit messages uh, written by the developers. Uh, finally, we obtain four patterns. Um, uh, that is addition pattern, removal pattern, fixed pattern, and avoidance pattern. We obtain these patterns through an automatic uh, a technique uh, consisting of the pattern mining and pattern merging steps. So, um, so uh, with the proposed uh, um, perspective, we can revisit the existing learning-based techniques from pattern, and uh, we want to observe what kind of commit messages can be generated by the existing techniques. In this table, we show the uh, ratio of each pattern in the commit messages generated by each technique. And uh, we can observe that uh, um, the majority of the generated commit messages belong to one of the four uh, predefined patterns, and, uh, uh, which is about 90%. This figure is much higher than the ratio uh, in the ground truth, which is only 46%. Uh, here we also give an example. In this example, the developer writes a commit message uh, which doesn't belong to any of the uh, four predefined patterns, but the commit message generated by the techniques all belong to fixed pattern. This is the reason why the pattern ratio is so high, because uh, the models generate the pattern message for the data whose ground truth doesn't belong to the, uh, any pattern. So uh, we, we can conclude that although the existing techniques can achieve promising performance in terms of NLP metrics, but they have limited capacity on generating the flexible messages. We also have an observation. Uh, the gap is uh, a difference between the uh, pattern ratio in the generated commit messages and the ground truth ones. And, uh, and the larger the gap is, the more uh, pattern messages the uh, model generates wrongly. And we can notice that the uh, gap is different uh, between different uh, patterns. So what results in the difference? The first influence factor is the length. Let's focus on the removal and the avoidance pattern. These two patterns have the similar pattern ratio in the training set, and, uh, but the avoidance pattern is generally longer than that of the removal pattern. Therefore, the gap of the removal pattern is larger because the uh, shorter commit messages are easier to learn and uh, the models tend to generate the messages of short length. The second influence factor is the ratio in training set, and uh, let's focus on the addition and the fixed pattern. These two patterns have the similar uh, length distribution, but the uh, ratio of addition pattern of, of fixed pattern is higher than addition pattern, so it has uh, a larger gap. This is because the higher ratio in the training set can provide more data to learn from, so the um, models tend to generate more fixed pattern messages. Uh, let's compare the length distribution between the ground truth and the uh, generated ones. We can notice that the um, generated commit messages have, um, have shorter lengths than the ground truth ones. This in the, uh, um, combined with the previous finding, we can uh, know that the existing techniques um, can, uh, have limited capacity on generating the long, uh, flexible, and comp complex messages. According to the first RQ, we know that the majority of the messages belong to simple patterns. So we will explore um, the potential reasons for it. Um, we will explore from the data sets and uh, input representations of the code changes. We reduce the pattern ratio in the training set, and we want to observe the uh, ratio and the blue in the generated commit messages. Uh, according to the first uh, uh, figure, we can notice that the pattern ratio is positively associated with that in the training set. 
And uh, in the bottom figure, we can notice that with the decrease of the pattern ratio in the uh, training set, there uh, the training data for pattern uh, data becomes insufficient, and uh, the blue on pattern message decreases gradually. But uh, however, also we um, remove the influence of the pattern messages. The non-pattern messages uh, still has um, poor performance, and uh, the um, and the the blue on the non-pattern messages remains unchanged. So the non-pattern data is inherently challenging for the models to learn. And the next we explore the mark representation. It's we uh, the mark representation replaces each token in the code changes with a corresponding mark. And we show an example of the mark representation. It contains only change information, and it doesn't contain any concrete uh, text. Um, but surprisingly, we can notice that uh, the mark representation can achieve the competitive performance compared to the original uh, representation. It's surprisingly because the mark representation only consists of three tokens, the manners, the plus, and the space. Um, the code context brings limited gain to the performance, so the models fail to compact, capture the syntax and semantics of the code changes. They mainly leverage the marks to generate the commit messages. According to the previous findings, we can have the following implementations. The purple, the pattern-based metric can compensate the NLP metrics which can reflect the structure and the distribution of them. In addition, uh, the developers can generate the messages through a two-stage generation way. They can first generate a pattern and then fill in the um, details of the pattern. And uh, the syntax and the semantics should be better captured by the models. One potential direction is to uh, remain only the changed tokens and uh, a few important unchanged tokens, such as the class name. Uh, then the model may focus on the uh, changed tokens, which are more important to understand the intentions. In addition, since the models uh, tend to generate the short messages, so we can add some extra loss to the short messages to urge the models to generate longer ones. Here comes the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Questions? Yes, please use the microphone. Uh, so I think you, you mentioned four patterns that are mostly talking about the changes of code, like you add something, remove something, or fix something. Yeah. I also think uh, like code refactoring could also be a case where you want to make a commit. Let's say you maybe rename some class, or maybe it's not just one class, but maybe 100 classes in my project has been renamed at all. So in that case, maybe the commit message does not fit the template you mentioned. So, so in that case, what, what can your approach uh, do and do you have any like considerations about these uh, uncalled patterns in the commit messages? Oh, thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, we uh, we manage uh, four patterns from the commit messages and uh, uh, the, um, the 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 commit method you mentioned uh, uh, refactoring. Uh, is not uh, meant from the, uh, the the messages because they uh, maybe they uh, they um, doesn't appear very frequently compared to other uh, messages. Uh, so um, so the models uh, we can notice that the uh, majority of messages belong to the four predefined patterns. So the maybe the refactoring. Um, and so for the refactoring case, uh, the, the existing models may uh, might not uh, uh, perform very well. Uh, so, um, so our um, techniques provides uh, provides a, um, a perspective to evaluate them, and uh, um, we can under the uh, models. Uh, the models can't uh, perform well on uh, other uh, cases um, um, besides the four messages. So uh, there, uh, there exist, exist uh, still um, uh, many limitations of existing techniques. Uh, unless it's a very quick question, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's pretty quick one. Yeah. Um, just when you were looking at your examples in the training data set, did you notice any differences in the generated message and then the like the magnitude of the code changes made? Is there any correlation in like size of commits or patterns? Um, do you mean the 
um, the difference between the uh, yes. generated ones and the ground truth ones. Yeah, when it comes to how much of the code was changed in the commit. Uh, how much code of, oh uh, yeah. Um, the data sets uh, um, we use consists uh, uh, many uh, different, uh, man, uh, many cases. Uh, the, uh, the number of the change lines range from maybe uh, two lines in one file or um, uh, involves multi, uh, multi uh, files. So, um, so for the for the case which consists only several lines of code changes, maybe the existing models can perform well. But for for the uh, cases consisting of um, more files, the models can have the dif difficulty to summarize uh, from the changes. Okay. Thank you. Mm, thank you. All right. Uh, let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next paper is titled um, on the uh, okay. Our next paper is titled on the commit message matters, investigating impact and evolution of commit messages quality. And if the car uh, Ahmed from University of California Irvine will present the paper. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for the intro. And welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the talk. Uh, so. My today's talk is about commit message matters, investigating impact and evolution of commit message quality. Uh, so the first author, GYE, could not make it today, so I'll be presenting it on his behalf. Okay, so as the previous uh, speaker was also saying, commit message is important, it makes sense. And Usually, the role of commit message is to provide the context of why a change has been made. And even in the absence of the developer who wrote the commit message, a commit message could play the role of event documentation. So good commit message matters. And interestingly, until very recently, we didn't actually have a very good formal definition of what constitutes as a good commit message. Most recently, TN et al. in ICSI 2022 uh, kind of define the first uh, definition of good commit message containing why and what. So what information is the summary of the change that is in the commit and why is why am I doing this? A description of the reason or justifications. So as you can notice, this was uh, very recent in 2022. Now when we were looking at their data set, Tian et al's data set, we noticed an interesting thing which is they assumed that the presence of an issue link, which is referenced in the commit message, is containing, or they assume that that presence uh, refers to having the why information. Now, when we looked a bit deeper, what we saw was very interesting. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, there are two screenshots. The first one is showing the commit message, and you can see the link that is referenced from there. And the bottom one of the uh, sli uh, slide is the actual link that is referenced to. And if you read the text, you'll see that is exactly the same message. So it's not essentially providing any additional why information. So that led us to start thinking that just the mere presence of a issue link does not really provide us the why information. So that led us to start thinking about these que research questions which is the first one is, as I mentioned, does the presence uh, of a reference link convey the why information? Does it always provide that? The second thing is, second question that we were interested in thinking is, how does commit message quality impact software quality? Specifically, we looked at defect proneness. And then, of course, does the quality evolve over time? Quality in terms of the uh, commit message quality, does it evolve over time or does it remain static? What happens? So these were the three research questions that we were interested in investigating. So now I will give you a very high level overview of the methodology that we used simply for the sake of time, uh, but to give you enough uh, kind of uh, idea of, of what we did. So we wanted to get a good sense of what real world developers think about the commit message quality. Uh, what do they think about the impact of having what and why? So we started by doing a semi-structure interview of 13 open source developers who had at least three years of experience. And then we also asked them uh, whether they believe that their 
commit message writing quality improves over time in terms of what and why? What is their perception of their own writing style? And then, of course, we wanted to do a larger scale analysis because only 13 people is, was not enough. So we conducted a large scale survey where we sent the survey out to Apache open source software developers. We reached out to about 2,600 developers and we heard back from completed 93 responses, which is 3.5%. Not a big uh, response rate, but uh, okay-ish. So then, uh, our, another, as you can, if you remember, one of our research questions was to figure out what is the impact of comment message quality. So that meant that we needed to have an automated mechanism for measuring the quality of comment message. And obviously, for doing automation, we tried database, uh, machine learning based approach, and we had to create our own training data. So for doing that, we relied again back on TN at L's data, uh, where they had manually labeled about 1,600 commit messages. So we took them and we relabeled 611 of those, which actually had uh, a link associated with them. Because if you remember, their criteria was just the presence of the link is an indicator of why, which we didn't agree, so we relabeled. And then we obviously tried different classifiers uh, that you can see here, LSTM by GRU, XGBoost, SVM. We tried all of these and we evaluated them in terms of the typically used uh, evaluation metrics like precision, recall, and F1. And we saw that the ensemble actually outperformed or did the best, both in terms of what and why. So we ended up using that for the rest of the paper. So this is a classifier that given a commit message would tell us whether there is what information, why information, and overall, is it good or not. So then uh, the next part in terms of analyzing the impact of commit message was trying to figure out whether the, a good quality commit message has any difference in terms of introducing or defect proneness or not. And to do that, we had to solve another problem, which is we had to identify commits that introduced bugs and commits that did not introduce bug. So for doing that, we relied on SZZ, the SZZ approach. So we started by first identifying the commit that fixed an issue or fixed a bug. And then we just used SZZ to find the commit that had introduced that bug. And now once we have identified the bug introducing commit, then our goal was to see the preceding commit messages of those bug introducing commits. So we just kept going back in the history. We took the preceding commit messages and ran the classifier that I just showed you in the previous slide. And we kept doing that for increasing window size. We just kept going back and back. And this is one important point that we should, I, I'll discuss uh, in, in the next slide. Uh, wh what was the window length that we went back up to? So this analysis we started by, we looked, started with 238,000 comets. And then of course we had to remove or do some filtering. So for example, we removed comets that were refactoring related. And then we also removed comments that were uh, written by bots. So that gave us about 15,000 comments that were defect introducing, right, using the approach that I uh, explained in the earlier slide. And then as I was saying, one important thing was to figure out how back far should I go in the history. And, uh, and it's important to think about it, right? Because if you decide to take a very small window size, you would be missing out of information and you would not be able to see effects of um, older commit messages. On the other hand, if you take too big of a window size, then you are essentially adding or introducing noise in the whole uh, calculation. So we tried different window sizes and I'll, I'll report those numbers uh, short. Uh, uh, in the next slide. And we came up with this matrix, window quality score, which is essentially the ratio of comments with positive labels within the window size and the total number of, uh, divided by the total number of, uh, you know, to the window size itself. So once we had all these mechanisms in place, then uh, the next thing was to actually investigate the commit message quality evolution itself. So. This, that was the last part of our analysis. Now, talking about the results, in terms of RQ1, which was, does the, just the mere presence of an issue link 
convey or provide the Y information. We found that that is not the case. We found that 89 or 14% or about 15% of the messages in TNATL's data did not provide the Y information. And for the reasons, for example, the link itself was broken. And then the content was just simply a replication of the commit message, the example that I showed you at the very beginning, and badly written texts, which is a very common, well-known problem in terms of commit message. And uh, the uh, link just provided additional information on what, not really providing the why part of the information. So that was the answer to the RQ1. Now, coming back to the RQ2, which is, does the comment message quality have impact in terms of defect proneness? So as I said, we looked at varying window size, and that's the uh, leftmost column. We tried different window size, and in the paper, we have uh, even more window sizes. So what we did is we looked at whether there is a significant difference between the comment message quality of preceding comments that uh, of commits that introduced a bug versus the commits that did not introduce a bug. And we did a statistical test, and we also did Cohen's D to see if the effect size is large, small, or medium. Now, if you notice the table, if we, lay, let's say we take the first row, you can see that the Cohen's D is actually small. It's, it's 0 0.09, but statistic, statistically significant, though. And that's true for all of the window sizes. So what this tells us is that the commit message quality is associated with defect proneness. However, one important thing to notice is the effect size is small. So it's not that only the commit message is what's associated with introducing a bug or not. And we all already know that the defect prediction models that we have been building needs or is, requires a lot of other features. So it's just one of the other factors that contributes towards introducing bugs. So that was our RQ2. And then the next question was, how does the quality of commit message evolve over time? And this is the graph showing that we went up to 400 weeks because that was the median length of the projects that uh, we were analyzing. And as you can see here, the lines for both what and why and even overall quality is degrading. So what that means is the projects, the projects that we analyzed, the overall commit message quality is degrading over time. Now, if you remember, uh, in the very earlier slides, I was talking about how we asked developers about their own perception of their uh, commit message quality. And based on this analysis, we can see that it degrades. However, from the survey results, we saw that more than half of the participating developers mentioned that they, they believe that their commit message quality is improving over time, which is clearly not the case, at least based on our observation. Now, this is interesting. But not so much surprising in one sense, because in other fields of software engineering, we have seen similar trends where the perception is different from reality. So this is one of another such a case. Now, in terms of implications, um, the one, first one is obvious. The reference link should be considered when you are trying to measure the quality of the commit message. And of course, commit message quality, as our result showed, has association with defect proneness. May not be, it's a statistically significant, may not be very strong, but there is. And that's essentially another factor that we should be trying to consider when we're building our defect prediction models. And uh, which uh, is more kind of uh, interesting in the sense that it, the quality degrades over time. So, the project maintainers needs to keep an eye on it because it is going to impact the quality of their final product. And in terms of uh, future work, one thing that we did not investigate is the root cause, right? Why is the quality degrading? Is it the developers don't care? That apparently didn't seem to be the case when we were asking. So are they not aware or their lack of tools? What is the issue why it's degrading over time? So we don't have the answer to that. And that would be an interesting direction to look at. And that was my talk. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Hello. Uh, just for your opinion, so uh, 
Do you think that uh, the coming of the LLM models will help improve the commit message quality? Thank you, thank you. Very nice question. So this is not published, right? So fresh from the oven. We actually tried using ChatGPT for generating commit messages. Yes, it does quite well. However, it does not really, uh, so I would say if you generate 100, 100 messages out of those in 90% of the time, it does produce a good thing, but in 10% of the time, it produces something which is not possible as for a human. So to answer your question, yes, it will help in 90% of the case, but in 10% of the case, it's really not there. So you cannot simply blindly trust what ChatGPT or any large language model is generating. Uh, follow, follow up questions. Uh, to do that, what information you provided to the ChatGPT? So you're asking about the... Uh, the yeah, to, to generate a commit message, what, what do you put in the chat? So that was not part of this paper, right? That's yeah, something yeah. that is ongoing right now. So we can, I think we can talk, uh, take that offline. Maybe yeah. that would be better. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, any other questions? Very quick questions? Okay. Please use this mic. Yeah, I'm just wondering, so with the uh, part where you interviewed and um, you know, you surveyed all those different people. Did you find any difference in terms of, because in relatively big projects such as Apache, it's a little bit different in terms of style, of course, mm -hmm. to some smaller projects where, uh, you know, smaller group of people, maybe less standards. So in your interviews of the 13 people, were they from any specific area or, and how did that impact? Like, did you find anything differences between those two? No, so those 13 people, so those 13 people were also from uh, Apache. Okay. So, I mean, and the, we were kind of targeted towards Apache because we know that Apache has very strong guidelines for what goes in in the commit message. They have, they are one of the very few projects that has that, or ecosystems that has that guideline. So, so we could not see that effect because all of our people were coming from the same ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Um, our next paper uh, is a journal first uh, paper presentation and the title of the paper is on the significance of category prediction for code comment synchronization. Uh, and Zheng Yang will present the paper. Ah, thank you. Thank you for an solid introduction. So hi everyone, my name is Yang Zhen. I'm from the City University of Hong Kong. Today I'm very honored to be here to report our latest work entitled on the significance of category prediction for code common synchronization. This work has been published on the ACM transaction on software engineering and methodology and completed under the collaboration of CTU, uh, WHU, TNUS, and PKU. Uh, so first of all, uh, let me introduce the background. With the software evolution, new features may be added in the software and some optimized features may be re replaced or removed. Thus, corresponding comments are also needed to be synchronized. However, software comments sometimes are not properly updated in sync when the associated co code is changed. For example, we list two uh, samples here from a real project in figure one. <clears throat> the first sample is extracted from Apache, uh, while the second sample is from Google. The green line denotes the newly added statements, while the red line denotes the statement remote. For some one, the new code has not considered the variable create session folder. Instead, it kept it as true by default, but the comment did not remove it. For example, two, the file path uh, Java test slash has been changed in the new code, but the modification in common has not been made correspondingly. Uh, this code common in consistent samples are called CSI samples in this work and the inconsistency between code and comments may mislead the developers and result in future bugs. Such code common synchronizers are necessary, uh, which aim to automatically uh, synchronize comments with code changes. Uh, existing uh, code common uh, synchronization projects can be divided into two categories. Uh, one is deep, learn deep learning based projects such as CUP and another one is heuristic based approach such as HTTP CUP. However, such samples are complicated in practice. A uh, single type of approach is not enough to accurately synchronize all comments when the associated code is constantly evolving with various kind of manners. Sample one and two are exactly the typical uh, examples. 
simple one cannot be correctly handled by EBCUP because uh, it, it lacks of explicit replacement pairs, but can be correctly handled by COP due to its learning based attribute. While sample two cannot be correctly synchronized by COP owing to the destruction of high fre frequency tokens such as SRC and test, while it can be correctly synchronized by HEBCOP. Uh, based on both uh, motivating examples, we conducted a serious preliminary, preliminary analysis, and we have the following findings. Uh, from the figure 2A, uh, we found that HTTP COP can correctly synchronize more distinctive CSI samples than COP does within the first attempt. Uh, from the figure 2B, we found that COP can correctly synchronize more distinctive CSI samples than HTTP COP does with five attempts. And from the figure 2C and figure 3, we found that HTTP COP can reduce the edit distance or more distinctive CSI samples than, H than COP does, but COP can reduce more edit distance uh, over the whole data set on average. Uh, besides, HTTP COP prefer to handle samples having more edit actions or replace and fewer actions or insert and deletion in their code changes, whereas uh, COP is not overly uh, dependent on the added actions like HTTP COP during the code common synchronization as shown, as shown in the figure four. Then we carry the idea that we can conduct a classification for CI samples based on their model uh, pronouns before fitting them to the corresponding model for synchronization. Um, based on our analysis above, we propose our approach, namely CBS, which means classifying before synchronizing. This approach combines av advantages of COP and HTTP COP with the assistance of inferred category of CSI samples. Specifically, we first define uh, two categories, including heuristic prompt and non heuristic prompt for CI samples. The samples whose comments can be correctly synchronized by HTTP COP are heuristic prompt, while others are non heuristic prompt. Thereby, we constructed a binary classification data set. Secondly, we we'll propose five features to facilitate, facilitate the representation of internal relation patterns between CSI samples and their model pronouns, thereby uh, assisting category prediction as shown in the table one, uh, including replace rate, uh, master level norm, non lateral count, uh, longest change sec, and the total change norm. Then, we, uh, due to the binary classification data set is unbalanced, uh, more non heuristic samples and less heuristic prone ones. Thus, we further propose a multi subset ensemble learning a classification algorithm to alleviate the class imbalance problem and construct a category prediction model, as shown in the figure five. Uh, as shown in the figure six as a whole, uh, CBS first extract features uh, for samples, then it uses a trained MSCO algorithm to predict the category of the new sample. And if the predicted category is heuristic prone, CBS employs HTTP COP to conduct a co common synchronization for the sample. Otherwise, uh, CBS allocates COP to handle it. Uh, as shown in the table, table two, uh, our extensive experiment demonstrates that CBS statistically significantly outperform uh, COP and HTTP COP and obtains a considerable, considerable improvement in, term of, in terms of uh, accuracy recall at five, uh, AED, RED, blue four, and uh, ESS ratio. Uh, in addition, uh, we also conducted a series of further studies on each module of uh, CBS. MSEL algorithm need to be driven by a base classifier. We found that LightGBM performs best among all classifiers we tested, including NIO base, random forest, decision tree, MLP, BIOSTM, and CN, as shown in table three. Uh, secondly, we find that using MSEL algorithm can obtain more correct and effective synchronizations, while without MSEL algorithm, CBS has a more generalized capability to all CI samples, as shown in figure four, table four. <clears throat> uh, from the figure seven, uh, we found that uh, if the user prefer more correct, uh, sorry, uh, previous, uh, if we found that if users prefer more correct and uh, effective synchronization, they can adopt a replace rate, a match level norm, total change norm. There's three features to train the category predict, uh, clarification model in CBS. While if they prefer the approach with a better generalization capability, they have better choice of our features to train the classification model. That's all about, about our presentation. Thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, so we're going to move to the next presentation. Thank you. If you have questions, please make sure to ask the speaker offline. Thank you.
Uh, all right, uh, the next two presentations will be uh, delivered remotely. Um, and uh, the title of the presentation is Correlating Automated and Human Evaluation of Code Documentation Generation Quality. And um, Zheng Zhu will present the paper. Um, please go ahead. Can you hear us? Yes. Can, right. you, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, now I begin. Uh, hello, everyone. I will briefly introduce our published paper in the Tosan Journal. Uh, this paper aims to learn the uh, cor correlation between automated and the human evaluation of code documentation generation quality. My name is Hao Ye Wang from uh, Hangzhou City University, and my our co authors are Hu Xing, uh, Chiu Yuan Chen, uh, Xin Xia, Jerry Law, and uh, Thomas Semohan. And now begin. Uh, in, the re in recent years, many approaches and tools have been approached, proposed to generate documentation from the source code automatically, such as code comment or comment messages. Uh, sorry, automatic uh, metrics like Blue, Roach, Material, uh, CIDR, and uh, SPIC in NLP domain are adopted to evaluate these code documentation models. Generally, these metrics measure different models by comparing overlapping text uh, between the reference and the generated uh, uh, documentation. Uh, obviously, this is not very consistent with human evaluation behavior. Some works evaluate the quality of models through automatic metrics accompanied by a human study in which programs are asked to rate various aspects of the generated contents or naturalness of the documentation. But the user study is time consuming, costly, and uh, relying on subjective judgments. Uh, it is important to determine how well these metrics compare to human judgments. So we conduct uh, experiments on two types of code documentation generation tasks. Uh, the first one is uh, code comment uh, generation. Uh, given a uh, uh, snap code snaps of a function, uh, the code uh, comments are used to describe the functionality of the programs. Um, we choose the three uh, state of the art uh, models, uh, which is shown in the uh, slides. Uh, the second task is the commit message generation. Uh, commit messages are the description of the code changes, which are helpful for developers to understand the software ev evolution. We also choose the three models, uh, MNT, NGN, and PTRGN, CMSG. These approaches are usually evaluated by human evaluation metrics and the automatic metrics to figure out whether automated metrics are reliable and uh, can indeed replace human judgment in the domain of automatic code documentation. Um, we explore the correlation between five automatic metrics and the six human evaluation metrics for code documentation generation tasks. For each task, uh, we first uh, use the three approaches. Uh, for code comment generation task and the commit message generation task. We evaluate them by using automatic metrics and the human evaluation metrics. We invite 24 evaluators to score 200 randomly sampled comments and the comment messages respectively. Then we analyze the correlation between uh, different automatic and human evaluation metrics. Uh, we explore three research questions in our paper. The first uh, research question is what are the results of state-of-the-art approaches on automatic metrics and the human evaluation metrics? We can find that documentation generated by different approaches achieve almost equivalent uh, results to human written documentation in language-related aspects. Um, but on the content, but on the content-related and the effectiveness-related aspects, more advanced methods still need to be proposed. Uh, in this research question, we explore the metrics uh, correlation inside of human evaluation of automatic evaluations. Uh, the part 
outside the box of the figure shows the candle and the Pearson correlation results among the among evaluation metrics for comment generation and the comment message generation. In research question two, we mainly explore uh, correlations in human evaluation metrics and the automatic metric, uh, metrics respectively. In the research question three, we further, further analyze the, the correlation between automatic metrics and the human evaluation metrics. This correlation re reveals how much automatic metrics can reflect the human perspective. According to the figure, we can observe that the usefulness and the understandability are most relevant to adequacy. In other words, the usefulness and the understandability of generated documentation depend on whether it contains enough useful information carried from the input. Therefore, we can imp improve existing automatic metrics by considering the input source code. First, we should identify tokens that are related to documentation in the input. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, that's all. Thank you. If you are interested, you can see our paper. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I think Screen sharing was stopped at some point. I'm not sure whether it's a technical problem on that side or on the speaker side. Um, anyway, we have time for one very quick question, if there is any. Yes, please go ahead. Thanks for your presentation. And um, uh, we know that the um, ALP metrics might be, um, have some, uh, doesn't um, uh, adhere to the uh, human uh, human evaluation, um, but do you think there uh, what can be um, can be done to improve the uh, the automatic metrics? Uh, uh, which is shown in our paper, uh, we we think uh, we should identify tokens that are related to documentation in the input, such as identifiers and the APIs in the source code. And uh, we can compute the overlapping rate between the generated documentation and the identif identified tokens. And we can get the final score by integrating existing uh, automatic metrics and the overlapping rate. Oh, yes. Um, okay. but, but, I think, uh, but I think this um, uh, identifiers or tokens can't um, uh, can't reflect the syntax semantics of the uh, the code changes, so maybe um, this can also be considered. Uh, yes, uh, we can consider the sem semantics using the uh, some deep learning uh, approaches in the future. Maybe. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Our last paper presentation on this session is also journal first paper, and it's also going to be a remote presentation. And the title of the paper is Predictive Comment Updating with Heuristics and AST Path Based Neural Learning, a Two Phase Approach. Hello, everyone. I'm Bolin from National University of Defense Technology. It's my great honor to introduce my work today. My topic is predictive common update with heuristic and its path-based neural learning, a two-phase approach. This is our collaboration with researchers from Zhejiang University. Natural language comments are important for understanding associated code. Usually, comments record information such as the intention of functions and the implementation details, which makes it easier for developers to communicate. According to a study by Shad, users spend about 58% of their time on program comprehension. However, about 10% of comments are not up to date, which means users may spend more time on program comprehension. Therefore, the quality comment directly affects the quality of software development. Uh, here's an example of better comments. The deletion of errors changes the semantic of this method. method. It wasn't until two months later that the developer updated the distribution of comments. 
Therefore, we ask the question, can we update the comments automatically? If a corresponding comment can be updated automatically, it can mitigate the impact of bad comments and save developers time. It's an inherently big approach can only work on common updates whose change content can be found from a corresponding code changes. Deep learning bases are less effective than a hasty base. In this paper, we propose topper uh, uh, key ideas to predict where a type of technique should be used for a given code change. Our first goal is to figure out how to predict the type of common update. For this end, we analyze 10 different features of code changes from three dimensions, code change complexity, involvement, and context. Here's a summary of the investigated features. In short, the complexity dimension features measure the number of modified items like token and subtoken in a code change. Two involvement features count the number of tokens or subtoken in the old common that disappear after code change. We study this feature because when a token that occurs in the old common disappears after a code change, it's like the common need to be updated based on the code change related to to let token. For the code change contact dimension, we investigate the type of statement and expression where the code change happens. This figure shows the distribution of edit features reflecting code change complexity and involvement. The results indicate that the distribution of values for all features varies across different type of common update. We also investigate whether the context under which the code changes tend to trigger non-code indicative updates. This table shows the top five contexts where the code change happen and the corresponding proportions. Uh, we can see the proportion difference expression type are negligible, but when it comes to a statement type, the difference becomes apparent. Hence, we discard your last feature and use the first nine features in this table as a feature of classifier. Uh, this figure is the framework of our update, which follows the encoder-decoder paradigm. During the encoding step, we extract the operation paths by comparing the different models between the old and the new ST from a given code change. We learn that the code change and the common vectors separated uh, before connecting them for the subsequent step. During the decoding step, we generate the sub tokens of new common one by one. For more details of our, our data, please refer to our paper. Therefore, the framework of our two phase approach is shown in this figure. Uh, given a code change with the old common of code, top first is charge the features and the length and the feature into classifier. If the given input is identified as a code indicative update, Topo directly reuse the hashtag based update for common update. Otherwise, Topo use update design for non code indicative updates. Note that if the hashtag based update can generate any update, we switch to our update to update the common. The table lists the performance of Topo and the baselines. The results show that the Topo improves the SOTA by around 20% in terms of the number of generated correct comments. Additionally, the RED value of the Topo is better than that of the existing approach. Uh, this paper is published at the IEEE TSC. That's all. Thank you.